Uh, many of you have been to informed sessions in the past. Uh, and just as a reminder, um, the purpose of Inforum is to bring together, bring together, I should say, leaders in the Atlanta community to learn together, to see each other regularly, to deepen our relationships so that we can more easily collaborate and identify solutions for our communities. This is our fifth uh, Inforum session this year, and we really are happy that all of you are here and that all of us will spend a couple hours together talking about public policy and advocacy. About uh, a little over a year ago now, the United Way launched um, the Child Wellbeing to develop pathways for thriving communities and children and families. And today's discussion on public policy and advocacy is a critical part of creating child well-being for thriving communities and families. And of course, in order for us to get to know each other better, we have to introduce ourselves and we have to know each other's names. And so, yay, here's the fun part. You get to introduce yourselves. So I'm going to pass the microphone around and I want you to please, I ask you, I should say, to stand up and give us your name and your organization name and we'll just kind of quickly do a round robin and that way um, you'll know the names of our speakers but they'll also know your names. We'll start with Laura Hyman. Hi, my name is Laura Hyman. I'm project manager for partner engagement here at United Way of Greater Atlanta. Hi, I'm Christy Naylor. I am the volunteer services coordinator with Cobb County Senior Services. Hello, my name is Aisha Parham. I am the fatherhood liaison for DeKalb County Family and Children's Services. Hello, my name is Contina Moore. I'm the resource coordinator for World Changers Church International. Hello, my name is Christy Carter and I'm a program director at CJCC. Hi, Cynthia Valdez. I'm a planner at the CJCC. Hello again, Natalie Williams with CJCC. Hello everyone, my name is Natrell Tudor. I'm the coordinator of fundraising corporate relations for Mary Hall Freedom House. Hello, my name is Marissa Marshall. I'm a development intern at Mary Hall Freedom House. Hello, I'm Kimia Motley. I'm the founder of Haven of Light International. Good afternoon, I'm Sandra Barnhill and I'm the national president for Forever Family. Hello, I'm Jamie Perez, and I am the Safe and Stable Families Project Director for the Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. Hi, I'm Andrea Tapps, Family Law Paralegal for Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. Hi, Mary Koenig, a social worker with Atlanta Volunteer Lawyers Foundation. Hi, I'm Caitlin Cole. I'm the Grants Coordinator at Drew Charter School. Hi, I'm Maddie Goosens. I'm the Grant and Analytics Specialist at Catholic Charities Atlanta. Hi, I'm Amy Korn. I'm a corporate communications executive and United Way volunteer and a Women United board member as well. Good afternoon. I'm Patrice Holt with Start to Soar. Hello, my name is Lillian Burton. I'm the program coordinator with the Salvation Army Boys and Girls Clubs. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Sojourner Marable Grimmett. Director of External Affairs for National Church Residences, Affordable Housing for Seniors. Hi, I'm Kendra Thomas. I'm the Assistant Director at Branch Outreach Center. Hi, I'm Hannah Tweel with United Way of Greater Atlanta. Hi, I'm Sierra Brown and I am the Marketing Intern with United Way Atlanta. Thank you. Hi, I'm Katie Weasak, and I'm with Voices for Georgia's Children. Hi, I'm Osma Azhar, and I'm the Policy Associate with Georgia Statewide After School Network. Hello, Christy Merritt with the Drake House. Hi, Patricia Smith, Executive Director at Solomon's Temple. Good afternoon, I'm Matthew Evans, Director of Public Policy for the Southeastern Council of Foundations. Justine Ferreira from DeKalb County Casa. Hi everybody, I'm Callie and I'm a project manager at Voices for Georgia's Children as well, I'm Katie. Okay. 
<laughs> I'm Ariel, and I work at Spark. I'm Joy Melendez, and I'm a community connector for Spark. I'm Jalen King. Um, I work at Spark as a community connector in Clayton County. LaShondra Adams, advocacy coordinator for Fulton Casa. Natalie Washington, program director, Fulton Casa. Lisa Biddings with Spark. I am a new neighborhood coordinator. Hi, I'm Vanessa Peters. I work with Spark as a new neighborhood coordinator in DeKalb County. Hi, Lynette Perryman. I'm with Spark Achievement Club coordinator. Hi, Joy Monroe with Spark. Hello, I'm Whitney Moye, uh, Achievement Club coordinator for Spark. <laughs> Hi, Meg Rogers with the Cherokee Family Violence Center. Hello, I'm Shanta, and I'm with Come Grow With Us. Hi, Delano Massey, executive founder for Come Grow With Us. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lummis, and I'm here with the Door to Justice Project. Hi, everyone. My name is Natasha Aladina, and I'm an attorney with Georgia Justice Project. Hi, my name is Helen Moon, and I'm a fellow at the Georgia Justice Project. Good afternoon. I bring you greetings on behalf of Atlanta Technical College. My name is Tarita Rogers, and I'm Executive Director of External Affairs at Atlanta Technical College. Hello, I'm Janine Osborne with United Way of Greater Atlanta. Hi, I'm Janice Robinson with the uh, Volunteer Involvement Program. If you need board members, see me. Ann Daney with United Way of Greater Atlanta. Good afternoon. Uh, Mary Wilson, Community Development Liaison, HPAC, also United Way Volunteer and Tri-Cities Archie Stewardship Committee. I'm Mary Sheffield, um, a United Way VIP, thanks to Janice, and a United Way Volunteer. And I also uh, have a nonprofit that started in the last year or so got called Because and I'll be happy to tell you about it later. Hi, I'm Aruna. I'm from Tapestry, and I'm one of the DV advocates. We work with the refugees and the immigrants. Hi, I'm Melanie Kagan. I'm a regional director with United Way of Greater Atlanta. Hello, I'm Teresa Smith with Share House Domestic Violence Center. Hi, I'm Vanessa Wilkins. I'm with Promise Place, which is a domestic violence shelter program. Hi, I'm Magdalene Yonker, Emory University, Grady Hospital. I'm Laurie Goodlai from the Center for Pan-Asian Community Services Programs Manager. <clears throat> Hello, I am Charity Dizelle. I am the Housing Case Manager at Live Safe Resources. Good afternoon, my name is Valerie Hurston, Housing Case Manager, Live Safe Resources. My name is Elaine Hudson, I'm Associate Director of Programs at Hands on Atlanta. Hi there, I'm Lauren Baker. I am uh, transitioning to a new role as our Manager of Corporate and Foundation Relations at Children's Museum of Atlanta. Happy Tuesday. I'm Robbie Crawford. I'm, I'm a professional mentor and lead coach for the Orange Duffel Bag Initiative. Good afternoon. I'm Juliette Lockman, and I'm working as a contractor with um, partner engagement, Tiffany and Laura, here at United Way of Greater Atlanta. I'm Greg Cole, the executive director of Emmaus House. Hi, I'm Catherine Stilarski, director of Women's Leadership Initiatives at United Way. Economy Jackson, Associate Director Income, United Way. Sarah Carlson, starting a nonprofit. Liz Ward, I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for United Way. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. We hope that you will be inspired today and learn new ideas from our panel about things you can do in your organization to engage your volunteers, your donors, and your stakeholders 
about ways to use public policy and advocacy to support your mission, the mission of your organization. And it's great to see such a cross-section of expertise in the room. And I think that what we're going to talk about today, today does apply to each and every one of you. And I think um, particularly the domestic Pan violence panel this morning, I think, even though we're going to be talking about pu public policy and advocacy, I think you're going to learn a lot and see a lot of um, cross-reference between what we talked about this morning with domestic violence and the work that these two folks are doing um, in their daily lives. First, just a couple quick announcements before I make our introductions. Um, there will be opportunities for you to ask questions, so if you would, just jot down your questions as you listen to the panelists. Um, there will be a pan I mean, and as you listen to our speakers, there will be a panel discussion that Anne is going to be leading after their presentations. Um, secondly, if you want to get a copy of the presentation, this is being um, uh, taped and will be on our YouTube channel, which you can find on the United Way YouTube site and is also on Facebook Live. You can find on our Facebook um, page, um, on, also on the YouTube uh, Facebook page. And then sec uh, thirdly, last, if you didn't get your parking validated, when you're leaving the building, um, as you go out the front door into the parking deck immediately to your left by the elevators, there's a desk and you can get your parking validated uh, before you leave so you don't have to pay for parking. So if you didn't get that announcement um, earlier. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. I'm going to go ahead and introduce all of them in, uh, in order. Uh, first up is Ann Mintz. Ann is a senior director here of public policy and advocacy. Let me put up their beautiful photographs <laughs> so you can look at them instead of me while I talk. Uh, Ann uh, has been, uh, let's see, is a senior director of public policy and advocacy for the United Way. Um, as well as for the United Ways of Georgia, a membership association of all 35 United Way affiliates and has been since 2006. She's worked with Georgia's General Assembly for over three dec decades, always in public interest capacity, and began her career in Georgia with the Department of Community Affairs, moving on to serve as the Association County Commissioners of Georgia's first ever Legislative Director for Health and Human Service Issues, and then several other organizations concerned with health and human service issues before joining the United Way. Anne holds a Master of Public Administration, and she's an active member of the Georgia Professional Lobbyist Association and the Junior League of Atlanta. After her presentation, we will hear from Doug Amar. Douglas B. Amar has been associated with the Georgia Justice Project, or GJP, since its inception in 1986, serving first as a volunteer and then as a staff lawyer in 1990, and since 1995 as the executive director. GJP envisions a world where a criminal history does not stand in the way of a stable life, delivering a comprehensive suite of services that couple holistic legal defense and social services with advocacy support to address the barriers to economic stability faced by the criminally accused. GJP's work was featured in the 2012 edition of Forces for Good, The Six Practices of High Impact Nonprofits by Leslie Crutchfield and Heather McLeod Grant. Doug has received the prestigious Annie E. Casey Foundation Fellowship and a number of other awards, including most recently the Albert P. Tuttle Jurisprudence Award from the Southeastern Anti-Defamation League. And then last but certainly not least, we will hear from Marissa McCall Dodson. Marissa McCall Dodson joined the Southern Center for Human Rights in 2016, where she is responsible for developing and advocating for legislation that furthers the mission, including reforming harsh sentence laws, enhancing alternatives to incarceration, abolishing, abolishing I should say, the death penalty, strengthening the public defender system, and ending, ending the criminalization of poverty. Before joining SCHR, Marisha, Marissa worked on the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, campaign for smart justice, assisting advocacy efforts to significantly reduce prison population relations and improve the quality, scope, availability, and accessibility of services that address the needs of impacted communities in the South. 
Marissa received her BA in political science from Spelman College in 2005 and her JD and bachelor's in civil law from the Paul Her M. Hebert, I believe you say, Law Center at Louisa Louisiana State University in 2008. She is a member of the Georgia Bar. After we hear from our distinguished panel, Anne will lead Doug and Marissa in a panel discussion, and we thank all of you for being here. And now we'll turn things over to Anne. Thank you. <coughs> How do I advance the slides? Do you want to use this? Mm -hmm. Am I, am I on? You're on. Okay. Good afternoon, folks. <coughs> as you, as uh, Tiffany mentioned, I've been around longer than dirt. So um, I'm pleased to be, <laughs> be here with you today. There's an awful lot of nonprofits in our state, but there's very few that take the time to strategically engage in public policy and to develop that function for their organizations. And what I'm going to do today is just give you a little overview of how you can take that message back to your own organizations and develop some str strategies for your own engagement. Nope, going the wrong way. Okay, there's just five quick takeaways that I want you to have today. If you're an IRS 501c3, and I know there's a couple of you that are not IRS 501c3s, you are other tax exempt, like in the case of the Metropolitan College or for the, the private sector, but if you're an IRS 501c3 that accepts non donations, you can engage in public policy and advocacy. But electioneering is expressly prohibited. This is a really important point because where are we in the electoral cycle right now? Lobbying is just one form of advocacy. There are other forms of advocacy. Lobbying is one. Only 501c3s that are classed as public charities can engage in lobbying subject to federal and state limitation. When I say public charities, the IRS categorizes 501c3s as either a public charity or a private foundation. If it's a private foundation, generally what you'll see is that their annual 990 reporting form says 990PF for private foundation. They cannot lobby. They can do other things that are advocacy but not lobbying. And finally, to be effective, you have to build the organizational capacity and develop strategic advocacy strategies. Whoops, wrong way again. Okay, so what, it, what is it exactly that we're talking about, non, about public policy? And believe it or not, there are organizations that we all respect, people that we look up to that actually don't know the answer to this question. Public policy is basically anything that decisions that are made by elected or appointed officials, the legislative branches of government, executive branches of government, judicial branches of government, uh, uh, voters when they themselves are the policy makers. Some of you may remember that our United Way registered a ballot committee, Safe Harbor Yes, to persuade voters to adopt Amendment 2 that appeared on the ballot in 2016, and that amendment was to create a Safe Harbor for Sexually Exploited Children Fund. We're the only uni United Way in the country that's ever done that, and we're probably the only nonprofit. But the reason that we were able to do that is because when we, you are dealing with a ballot question, the voters themselves are the policy makers that are electing to make a policy decision, and that is, in that case, it's direct lobbying. The levels of government that we're talking about here, in, especially in Georgia, are myriad. There are federal, state, and local. We have school boards, we've got special districts, we've got authorities, so it's all of those together. Any questions so far? Wrong way. So why would a nonprofit 
seek to engage in public policy and advocacy. And I think when you hear Doug and Marissa speak, <clears throat> one big reason is that the only way that you can possibly help the people that you are intending to serve, that your mission and goal is to serve, is through making a change in public policy. That there's other things you can do for them, but if you really want to help them, you've got to have a change in public policy to do it. <coughs> you want to have to build the public and the political will for your nonprofit's overall mission and goals. Many people are energized to be engaged in public policy and advocacy, and that sort of helps people to get engaged with you. And a, a lot of folks <laughs> and uh, are also engaged because they just don't want something bad to happen to their organization, and so they are in that space just so that stuff gets proposed that is just going to be a non-starter can be there to get it amended or get it killed. Because trust me, in the nonprofit world, it's what you're getting amended or killed that counts just as much or maybe even more sometimes than what you won in terms of a new pu public policy issue. You want partnerships with your federal or state or local governments. And you want to be in that space because you want to discover other levels of government that share your objectives and create partnerships with them to achieve those objectives. And lastly, you want to promote civic engagement among the people that you serve. Questions so far? Oh, wrong way. OK. <coughs> Let me clear my throat before I get to this one. Electioneering is absolutely prohibited. For us in the 501c3 world, it's the equivalent of the third rail. Don't do it. You will lose your tax exemption. You, you will not be able to accept donations and have, give, allow somebody to take uh, a tax deduction for it. Now, what do we mean by electioneering? Or let me back up and say that this prohibition against electioneering is kind of like the trade-off. You're tax exempt, so you don't engage in political activity. If you want to be not tax exempt, then you can engage in political activity, but we're tax exempt. So that's kind of the trade for what kind of an organization we are. So what does it mean? Campaign contributions, absolutely. Can't, we can't, as a 501c3, United Way can't make a donation to any candidate for their election. We can't be endorsing candidates or rating candidates. There are some kindred in the 501c world like 501c6 that are chambers of commerce, membership organizations that can rate and endorse candidates. But if you're a 501c3, that's something you cannot do. You cannot distribute campaign literature either directly through web links, through social media links. Um, I recently was putting out information about an event that we're, we're hosting next week for some of our donors and could not link to a campaign site link because I would be distributing campaign literature. Just can't do it. Anything that's a written, oral, or visual expression that's a support of a candidate or against a candidate, you're wearing a button, you're wearing a shirt, whatever it is, that's electioneering. Things that are issues, that are proxy issues, that most people in the public would see that as tacit support for one or another candidate or political party, can anybody think of a slogan or an issue that would be a proxy? Make again? Yes, bingo. <laughs> bingo. <laughs> if I were to say, make United Way great again, uh -uh, no. <laughs> How about an issue? That would be, most people would see that as, oh, well, that's a proxy for so and so. Okay. Hmm? Immigration gets close, except it's such a nuanced issue. How about the wall? So when you start getting into things that most people in the public understand it as aligned to one candidate or one party or the other, that's where you got to sort of step back and say, okay, what are we doing here? Let's just you know, find a way to state this so it's not, it doesn't come across that way. Okay. This, is, this issue of electioneering is more art than science. The examples I gave to you are pretty well cut and dried. Like if I get up and at uh, some 
candidate forum and said, the United Way endorses you, that's obviously out of bounds. But there's a lot of gray areas here. Um, most of the time, our federal candidates for election and federal office holders understand that what we cannot do as 501c3s, but state and local candidates don't always. So, for example, you might, you might get asked, as we did, can we use your facilities for a press conference? Well, you know, that's very flattering. You want to use our, you want to come to us and do a press conference with us. Well, guess what? As soon as you have given space to a candidate for an, a campaign activity, you've just made an in-kind donation. You can't do that. There's when it was one, another one recently that was reported in the Nonprofit Times. A group in, a nonprofit in another state was holding a picnic. They advertised it in, in, on their own website. They didn't publicly advertise it. They were asked people to come and volunteer, and they got volunteers, but it was a political party who showed up to volunteer, and the political party was handing out literature and but campaign buttons for their candidates. Now, it was the nonprofit then that was at fault for allowing that electioneering activity to take place at one of their events. And as a result, one of their locally elected officials took public issue with them, particularly in light of the fact that they were receiving funding from the level of government that he served on. So, you know, they just, you, you stand to be hurt in too many ways. And when you think about it, even without this prohibition against electioneering, what if you could electioneer? What if you bet on the wrong horse and the other guy is not in office now? How do you have the relationship with that person? What about your donors and stakeholders that bet on the other, a different horse? How do you engage them in conversation? So it's just really important just to like just keeping yourself issue focused and not partisan focused or focused on a political campaign. There will be a lot of times between now and November that you're going to be tempted. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's bad for your organization. Any questions here? I see an arm. Yes, yes ma'am. Was it their personal Facebook page? Yes. Yes. I personally think that's an iffy judgment. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that, for, at least for me, when it becomes to the electioneering issue, is how well do people know me and know me in the context of the work that I do such that they probably can't make it to distinguish between me and my professional role here at United Way? You know, like I'm really not willing to put myself in that position where it's so iffy. I mean, he or she has probably got the right to do that as a First Amendment issue. I would just question, like, why put yourself there? Yes, ma'am. Similar question. Can an executive director sit on a, a PAC a committee, a PSD political action committee, and in a personal Yes, in a personal capacity. That kind of gets to the next slide here. Okay, so wh how does this affect me as an individual? Well, when you went to work for a 501c3, you did not park your First Amendment rights at the door. So your staff, your board members, your donors, your volunteers, they can express political opinions, they can make endorsements, they can make campaign contributions to anybody they want. They just can't do it in the name of your particular nonprofit, and they can't do it on the nonprofit's time or with its resources, including email and social media accounts. Questions on this? And again, going back to the latest question about the executive director, a personal Facebook page, he or she is within his First Amendment rights. I just question, you know, does anyone distinguish that person from the role? Any questions here before I go forward? Going to be a lot of temptations between now and November. <laughs>
Okay, so what's lobbying? Lobbying, as I said, is only one form of advocacy. Yes. Somebody here have a question? Yeah, I have a question about how um, strict should nonprofits be? And the reason why I'm asking this question is I know um, our colleagues in the state agency, so employees are not allowed to right. have bumper stickers on their cars that come into the parking lot for a candidate. So with nonprofits, how should that Well, I don't think we've gone so far as to have a, a policy on bumper stickers. They are private vehicles. Um, if I were in charge, I would say no bumper stickers. I mean, I purposely don't put bumper stickers on my car because I don't really want to be rear-ended in traffic. <laughs> but, you know, that you raise a valid point. If you can just keep people from displaying things, at least in the offices and on work time. As far as I'm concerned, that's probably as good as I'm going to get. I'm being told I have five minutes and I have so much more to tell you, but we won't get there. Okay, so what's lobbying? As I mentioned, lobbying is like one form of advocacy. And it involves a communication, whether it's oral, written, or, or um, visual about actual or proposed legislation. It doesn't even have to be written down. And it expresses a point of view on the legislation directly to the policymakers. Or I'm putting out, say, an action alert to you all to say, this bill is not a good bill because blah, blah. Please contact your lawmakers and do to do x, y, z. That is also lobbying. That's what's regulated. Lobbying's regulated. There's three ways. Congressional Lobbying Disclosure Act. That is something that probably doesn't affect most of us. For most of the effect that it has is you're filling out a grant application and people come to me and say, and do, do we need to check this box? Are we lobbying? They're like, no, because we, we don't come under the Congressional Lobbying Disclosure Act. IR, IRS 501c3 standards, yes, that's what we all come under, which means that you either elect no substantial part, that's the default that the IRS sets for how much lobbying you can do. Generally, people think it's 3 to 5% of your budget, but it could be that you're just so successful that, you know, during the political winds of the day, they decide you're going to be audited. Or you decide we're going to take the expenditure election, and that means I'm only going to report to the IRS exactly what I spent, not more, not less. And the IRS will only argue with me in terms of expenditures. And this has all got to be tracked and put onto your annual 990. And we have the Georgia Ethics in Government Act, which means that for anyone who's employed or retained as a lot to go down to City Hall, the General Assembly, to lobby, to express point direct lobbying and lead grassroots lobbying, I need to be registered as a lobbyist. And I need to make reports of certain expenditures. Okay, not lobbying. I guess I think my time is up, so I think I will just wave and allow the, to us to move on to the program. Is that what you prefer me to do? Two minutes? Okay. So lobbying is one form of advocacy that public charities can engage in. Not lobbying is somebody's on your board, they're a donor, they're a volunteer, or you've invited an office holder to speak. For example, when Sam Owens was still Attorney General, we would invite him to speak about trafficking. We were asking him to come speak about trafficking because he had some particular expertise on that topic. You can also testify if you were invited by the policymaker to come and testify that they wanted your input in particular. But you can't use any of those occasions to promote a political campaign or to lobby an office holder. Not lobbying is also civic engagement. You can educate voters about election processes, you can sample ballots, voter registration drives, candidate questionnaires. You can host candidate forums where everybody's treated fairly, but there are special rules here. I'm really oversimplifying everything in this presentation, so be careful. Other things that are not lobbying, stakeholder education, you can hold uh, public forums to discuss difficult issues, provided that there isn't any call to action 
that, that's associated with it. You can use your nonprofit as a means to convene people around a tough policy issue. And sometimes when it seems like there's really gonna, not going to be a lot of movement on a particular issue for some time to come, it keeps it alive for your stakeholders moving forward. Relationship advocacy. Invite your policymakers to come and visit with you so that they understand what your expertise is, what your needs are, and so forth. Um, help them if they've asked you to do something within the scope of what you know how to do. Like, sure, why not? Say yes. We had a lawmaker that, he's always got a group of people from China that want to come and learn about nonprofits. Is it a big pain in the rear end to me? Yes. But is it, is it something I can do? Yes. And will I have a relationship with that lawmaker because I did it? Yes. So that it's a good way to develop some relationships. And remember, the best time to get a policymaker's help is when you don't need it. So how do you develop the muscle to engage in public policy and advocacy? I've left a handout on your table that really kind of walks you through what you need to be able to do. And no, it's the one by Center for Lobbying in the Public Interest. Um, you need to understand first the law, what we talked about here today, develop a governance structure to make decisions around public policy, designate staff to be doing it, adopt a policy agenda, know what level of government makes decisions affecting it. Uh, I was with envy at Trees Atlanta uh, at one point, so envious that the only policymakers they had to deal with was the Atlanta Planning and Zoning Board and the Atlanta City Council. Like, that's simple. <laughs> but for, for a lot of us, it's not that simple. And then are you ready for prime time? Are you, do you know who the, these decision makers are that are going to be deciding your issues? Do you, you have relationships with these policy makers? What's your messages? Who are your messengers? What about your opponents and their messengers? Do you know about strategies and tactics that could be successful here? A lot of this is on your document, and I've also included some links in the um, slide handout that you can go to and get more. So I think I have um, uh, told my time, and I will move on. All right. All right, cool. Awesome. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doug Amar, and uh, unlike Ann, I'm going to move around. I've got to move around. Um, and um, so I thought uh, I'm a three-bucket person, so my three buckets today are... Uh, Really, to talk about I call it the origin of the story, like how we got into policy because we haven't always done it. Talk about what we've done, how, then how we how we've accomplished things and where we're going. Those are my three buckets. But I really want to do sort of talk about how we got there because I think a lot of well, I understood though some folks in the room certainly do policy already. Maybe some others are considering it, and I know it was a big uh, inertia for us to overcome as an organization to do it in the first place. So I think that's where I'm going to spend more of my time talking. But you all can ask whatever you want. Okay. So first, let me just talk about who we are as an organization. Is, um, uh, Tiffany did such a nice job introducing us and our work, but our, our organization is 30, 32 years old, and uh, we have primarily been a direct service organization, helping people, being their lawyers. I'll just say the three buckets of our work. See, back to three. There it is again. There's three buckets. <laughs> Must ask one, Doug, three buckets over and over. Yeah, the three buckets. And Marissa's even going, Mar over. Okay, three buckets. So the three buckets of our work are we do, uh, the thing we've done the longest is a holistic criminal defense. And what that means is we're like a private public defender. We, but we represent folks and stay with folks long after the case is over, into prison and afterwards, and rehabilitation. So that's what we've done the longest. And then about 15 years ago, we got involved in criminal records work, and that's our second bucket of direct service, helping people overcome the impact of a record, uh, you know, getting things off the record, get jobs and housing in spite of the record. And the third bucket is policy and education. So those are our three things, but it all stems back to helping people initially as their lawyer, as being involved with people. So actually, this is a, actually our card. I, like, I love this picture. These are pictures of some of our clients and some of the ways we've helped them and their family. Uh, a great visual to sort of orient you, if you will, to our work. Um, uh, but I'm, policy and education, this is just a quick, there's a bunch of handouts we've given you. So I'm not going to, I'm really not going to spend a lot of time talking about the things we've done or the accomplishments, but this gives you a quick sense of some of that because that's what we're here to talk about. Okay, so let's go back. Let's talk about uh, sort of how we got there. So... Um, the first thing I think to talk about, just to orient you why uh, we got involved in criminal uh, in policy is criminal records. Is we, in America, 
about anywhere from 30% or so, 25 to 30% of the population in America have a criminal record. And what that means is that a criminal record means someone who's been arrested and or convicted. In Georgia, that number is much higher. In Georgia, that number is about 40%. Uh, of folks in the state have been arrested and or convicted. So when you talk about, uh, you know, even though we help people individually, and then in that second bucket of our work, remember bucket two, direct services, criminal records, that's about 600 or so clients a year. I know, Natasha, that's too many. We're trying to keep it lower, but it's, we're trying to keep it. But the point is, we represent 600 people a year. There are 4 million people in Georgia with a criminal record. Uh, there's no way we're going to get to all those people, and there's no way we're going to be able to overcome the, these, these barriers. And that's sort of what led us to realize we can keep doing this, but we're only going to get so far helping individuals. And that's what will let us, th these numbers sort of let us up, up the route. So, um, again, I talked about our holistic defense, and we talked about, uh, one other thing to talk about is we, a way of dealing with criminal records early on, we had our own landscape company. We started in 92, 93 uh, to employ our guys coming out of prison that we ran as, a, as part of the nonprofit. But even that was really grounded in criminal records. Our guys coming out of jail and prison couldn't get jobs. Uh, and so we said, what can we do? Well, we, let's start our own business to hire some folks. Um, and that was wonderful. We ran it for 17 years, but the recession uh, sort of put a kibosh on that industry uh, in this town. But the point is, is that that was a, a way, in a direct service way, we were trying to deal with the same issue that led us upstream to get to the criminal records issue legislatively. Um, what else do we have here? Um, so let me just talk about how we really got into, into, into policy, and it really gets down to our criminal records work. So in 2003, 2004, we were asked essentially by two foundations, first in uh, MPUV with the Casey Foundation to help out, uh, we, you know, to help with uh, their efforts in, mainly in, in Pittsburgh and Mechanicsville. And just specifically what happened, uh, there was a, uh, I don't know, I'm looking at Sanders, she knows the story too well, but there was a, 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 a apartment complex that was being uh, torn down and there was 100 residents in that apartment complex. And that uh, the Casey Foundation, who's been a great friend to us and many people in the room, I'm sure, uh, they had just made a commitment to really help in that community. And 100 of those folks were being told they had to leave in 30 days. And then they learned that half of those families, somebody in the family had been arrested or convicted. And that their voucher, their HUD voucher, which everybody in that building was a HUD, it was a, a HUD voucher uh, building, if you will, were told they couldn't get another voucher because of the criminal record. So the Casey Foundation, because we were working with them, we were showing up down there. I was actually keeping office hours in Pittsburgh at the time. You all know where Pittsburgh is in Atlanta. Hopefully you all know where Pittsburgh is in Atlanta. I'm not talking Pittsburgh or where you're from more, the other Pittsburgh. <laughs> so I was even down, you know, keeping uh, office hours in Pittsburgh. And they asked us to help keep these folks in housing. And so we jumped in and in, a, in 30 days, we had 30 days to do this. And we were able to keep all but two folks that keep their voucher. And then we did the same thing again when they were tearing down what was called McDaniel Glen Housing Project. And we did it again with the Zeiss Foundation in the Edgewood neighborhood when there was a, a mass relocation there as well of folks. And what we saw really was that, of course, we saw the numbers, as I mentioned earlier, that so many people had a criminal record. The criminal records were such a barrier for folks. But also we saw that, one, there was nobody helping on that arena. We, we decided to do that. We'd always done some of that work, but it was a small part of our work. Um, and we also saw in doing those cases, and by the end of 2007, I think we'd done about 500 cases. We had volunteer lawyers from King and Spalding and Austin and Bird. I had folks helping lots of arenas. And it was actually some King and Spalding lawyers and Austin and Bird lawyers who came and said, Doug, you know, we can help you with another 500 cases or 200 cases, but you got to go change the law. And I remember, now let me put this in perspective. I'm, you know, we are, I'm a direct service guy, right? I'm helping people. And I'm, you know, I'm not a policy guy. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. But when a bunch of rich white Republicans come and tell you that you should go change the law, <laughs> to help people who have been arrested and convicted of a crime, you should listen. You should listen. And, and I, I said, what are you, are you kidding me? And I, had, you know, I, was, I was really taken off because they said, look, and then the law was terrible. Because they said, look, it, it was so hard to clean up people's records. And what we had, were doing then and are doing now is not just kind of making sure they had housing, but really changing the criminal record of somebody. And that's really what we saw was the big get, and still is the big get we do for folks all over the state. But the point is this, is that the law to get that done was so difficult. It took a long time. It was uh, left a lot of discretion and arbitrariness from the people who made that decision, mainly prosecutors. No offense if you've been one or have found. But the point is, is it was difficult, it was long, and it wasn't clear about what could come off somebody's record. So they said, look, we should go change the law on this. And I, I really thought, that's crazy. But, but I listened. And I realized that, that if we were going to work with another 100, 200, 500 people, that if the law were better, we could move faster, we could get more people's records cleaned up, people get more access to housing, people get more access to jobs, people get more access to benefits. 
So that's really what led us to that point, is, is, is sort of all this work we've done in two, really, a couple different neighborhoods. And there's really some folks who are helping us on, on a direct service side to do that. Um, and those same folks, by the way, well, let me, let, me, let me see what the next slide is. And then, uh, okay, yeah, I talked about that. So we decided to, we decided after that, when all that process was going on, we decided, okay, we will listen to our friends, and uh, we decided to launch, essentially, a whole new program in 2008. Uh, and in 2008, actually, I, I stood up. We had a, a big event at the King Center, and um, uh, we didn't have any money. I didn't have any funding. I didn't have any uh, commitments, but I said we were going to go change the law on criminal records, and we were going to go help people all over the state on this issue. And it was crazy. I mean, my board let me do that. I don't know why they let me do that. I, was, I stood up. I mean, it was, I just said, we're going to go do it. I, I, it was nuts, actually. And actually, Marissa will probably tell you, but we, she was, uh, Marissa came to work with us a few months after that, but we were in the process of a grant application for funding for her, and we hadn't even gotten that secured. And I was just like, well, we're going to do it somehow. But what was interesting is in the audience were legislators, people who've been our donors and our friends. And really, within a few months of that event, I started getting calls. I said, Doug, you said you're going to go change the law. Well, let's go. I mean, I'm like, well, wait, wait, we don't have any staff yet. We don't know what we're going to do. And well, you said you're going to change the law. I'm here. I'm, come on. I'll introduce you to people. And this was actually Kathy Ash. Yeah. A lot of folks know Kathy. <laughs> you know Kathy. That's, that's so Kathy. And Kathy was, has been a great, is a great friend and has been a great friend as we've moved in this arena. So anyway, that's just sort of a little bit of the origin story of what got us there. And I should mention, too, that isn't up here, is that uh, some of these same people who are volunteering and really, you know, convincing us to, to go upstream in the battle were also decided that they would write a book about, about these issues. And Anne, this is where I got to know Anne, is they said, look, we're going to write a book about the policy issues in Georgia as it relates to criminal records. And we kind of worked on this together for a few years with Mercer University Law School, a couple of big firm lawyers. And, uh, and, and the plan, which really worked incredibly well, was to sort of document what the policy issues were, not to take a position on what should change, that lines that Ann was talking about, but to really say, let's, you know, here's the lay of the land, and, it, and, and you, you all, whoever read the book, mainly legislators, judges, prosecutors, should think about this. When that book came out, the United Way actually sponsored a couple events, actually in this building, actually, uh, to sort of open the world up, you know, invited legislators, policymakers, donors, people came from all over the state to come here and talk. And, and that book is such a great lesson because that book gave us credibility. Uh, it gave us credibility in the issue. We had credibility because we'd done the work, but now we had a bunch of, you know, uh, thoughtful people writing about it. And, you know, we launched this uh, event and, and that book. We, I think we gave a copy of that book to every legislator in Georgia. Um, so all of a sudden, we started off so smartly, not due to me. I mean, due to really other smart people like Anne and others who helped us really map out a path. So I just want to give you that little bit of history. It's pretty cool. So anyway. All right. Let me just give you, uh, talk about some, some policy things here. That's, a, that's very small print. I will give you a couple, uh, <laughs> a couple of highlights here. You know, when I, even right, right after I announced this, I remember it was, it was the end of 07, I announced this, and, and I had no idea what we we're going to do or how we we're going to do it. So I went to a bunch of my nonprofit friends and said, and said, well, how do you do policy? I mean, what do you, you know, I had no idea. I mean, I'll be honest. I'll, I was an anti-policy person. I was. I mean, you can ask people who are still work with me. Ask Brenda in the office, and she'll tell you, our legal director. I was like an anti-policy guy. I was like, because I thought, Paul, I didn't know what I thought. I just didn't, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. I'll be honest. Most people who did policy work, they were fighting against something, as Ann talked. They were fighting to keep something bad from happening. And I got to tell you, that gave me no energy. I just said, I don't, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens. I'm in the criminal justice system, for God's sakes. Bad stuff is happening every day. We were just in court. Bad stuff happens every day. I mean, how am I going to, I mean, I said, I don't, listen, I'm fighting bad stuff every day. I mean, you, how am I going to do policy work that's going to fight more bad stuff? I said, if we did policy work, I wanted it to be proactive. I wanted us to go make something happen that wasn't going to happen but for our efforts. Now, I got to tell you, I, we, that's how we do our policy work, by the way. I mean, every now and then we do fight bad things, but, but taking that proactive lens to say we want X to happen, we want Y to happen, we want Z to happen, and we're going to go make it happen. That's a very different energy. And most nonprofits, honestly, that did this work don't do it that way. And that's why I probably resisted doing it in the first place. But I want to my friends, folks like... Uh, up on the wall here, folks at uh, the Barton Clinic in Emory, uh, Georgia Voices uh, for Children, um, the, what became Just Georgia. All these are friends of mine. And I asked them, how do you do this? And one of the earliest lessons I got, they said, Doug, you got to decide whether you're going to go inside or outside. I mean, I, I'm a big basketball guy. No, I don't play a lot anymore. But, you know, but, but the inside game versus outside game, you're going to have a post guy. You're going to go down low in the post, or you're going to circle from the outside. You're going to have shooters like my boy Steph Curry. I went to Davidson this morning. <laughs> I'm a Davidson guy. So my point is, 
how are you going to approach the work, inside versus outside? And it got me thinking. I mean, they said, look, you can, you can do a lot of organizing. You can get people on the street marching. Or you can go start meeting with legislators, kind of the way Ann laid it out. And uh, that was one of my first thoughts. Well, I don't know how to do that. And they said, well, if you're going to do the inside game, which many people suggest is the best way to do it, this is what the advice I got, you're going to have to get a lobbyist. I'm like, get a lobbyist? How do you get a lobbyist? And what, and what you, we don't have money for that. How do you do that? I mean, so, so that whole, I mean, we, I got great advice early on. I started talking to folks. I found out who the lobbyists were. And it turns out lobbyists in this town, there's a lot of lobbyists who work just for nonprofits. And that was amazing to me. I didn't, this, the strangest part, the lobbyist who helped us the most, was one of our donors for 25 years. I didn't even know he was a lobbyist. I, I, he was a lawyer, but I didn't know he was a lobbyist. And he became, and still is one of our best friends in this work, but the point is this, is that having that kind of advice, uh, going to folks, helping us navigate an inside game and an outside game, and we do both now, but, but the point is, is that you gotta make those fundamental decisions, and we had to make that decision early on. And I got great advice from friends, and it was very helpful. Um, so let me just give you a, a quick overview of how I think we think about policy work at our, at our shop now. You fast forward you know, 10 or so years later, and we do have sort of the inside game, the meeting with legislators. I was, we were down at the state, with Natasha, when we were last week, right? We were meeting with the legislator last week. Um, so we, and with our lobbyists, back to lobbyists, that dirty word. They did not have alligator shoes, I'll tell you. No alligator. <laughs> so anyway, so, so there's, a, there's meeting with lobbyists, meeting with legislators. That there's that part of it, which is, you know, I would say is actually um, as scary as it was to me 10 years ago. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, it seems if you're not in it, you go, how do you do it? But that's actually easier. It's more straightforward. Get somebody who knows how to work that, that arena. Get someone who, who can walk you to introduce people, who's on what committees, what is it you're trying to get done. And that's a, a more of a straightforward process. These next two bullets, I think, are more, uh, for us, a more generative engagement uh, process of, of community engagement. So for instance, uh, one of the earlier slides, we talked about our um, Justice Day, which we've done as an organization for about seven years. And this last year, we partnered with 33 different groups. We, we realized, actually, there was no criminal justice day at the Capitol when we started doing this work. I mean, you think about this. I mean, Georgia, this is criminal justice, guys. I mean, there, were, there was no, I, we couldn't believe it. I mean, you have days down there for like, you know, one-legged pets. I mean, you have, I mean, sir, I mean, I'm no offense to you dog lovers, all, you're hating me now, no. No, but, you know, you, you have, I mean, you have like the Parrots Association Day at the Capitol, right? If you're gonna, you're like, criminal justice affects 40% of the population. And, and obviously the disparities and the impact, et cetera, et cetera. There was no day at the Capitol. It blew me away. So we decided, well, we gotta start doing that. I mean, just bringing folks together to advocate for criminal justice reform. So that's one of the things we do. We gather folks this last year, I think we had almost 500 people at the Capitol, again with 33 different groups. And we actually sent buses to groups we work with in Columbus and in um, was it, where, Albany, Albany and Columbus. Sometimes we send a bus to Macon or Savannah because we work with folks in those parts of the state. That's a, one way of engaging folks and bringing folks to bear. Uh, another thing we do a lot in this last bullet I'll, I'll talk about is employer engagement. One of the things we learned when we started hanging out at the Capitol, when we started talking about criminal justice issues, criminal records, we, you know, legislators would talk, well, they would, we'd say, well, we want to get, you know, make it easier for people to get stuff off, off their records and help them get jobs, help them get housing. And, and the legislators would say, well, you know, the prosecutors, they, they tell us that employers want to know what, what's on everybody's record. I said, excuse me? Yeah, prosecutors tell us that they want to know what's on people's, uh, that employers want to know what's on people's records. I said, well, I get that prosecutors might take that position, but we realized, is that what employers want to know? I mean, we, we realized that that voice of employers, which by the way, I should connect this dots here a little bit, I should have said this. If you have a criminal, if you have been in the criminal justice system, the number one determinant factor of whether you're gonna go back to the system is whether you have a job. The, the highest correlation, job leads, a job leads to low recidivism, end of story, okay? And yet, of all the laws in this country, of the 47,000 laws that affect people with criminal records, 47,000 laws, according to the American Bar Association, 60 to 70% of those laws relate to employment, meaning they aren't good for employment, I mean, they're, they're bad for employment. And yet, when we showed up at the Capitol, we showed up at the Capitol, they were telling us that the, legis the legislators were telling us that, that employers wanna know about people's records. Well, how did they know that? Because, not because employers told them, because prosecutors told them. So we said, well, we need to talk to employers. We need to get to know what they think about how they, their hiring practices. Uh, and, and we went to them, and we still do. We'll probably have two more events before the legislative session starts this next year, 
is we gather employers, often through an invitation-only sort of perspective, but we ask them, what is it you need to hire more people? What's your barrier in hiring people with records? How could you hire more people who are coming out of jail or prison? What, is it a tax incentive? Is it, is it insurance protection? Is it liability? What do you need? And we don't go to these guys and tell them what they should do. We go to them and say, tell us what you want. And tell us how we can get to this result that we all believe will help the community. And, and they become partners in that. So then we start having a different voice show of the capital. We have a different perspective because we've created a different perspective and got to the very people who really, if you, you go back to that point about, employ, about employment and recidivism, we go to the very people who can ensure that our folks, our clients, will not end back in trouble. So this is just a couple examples of ways that we approach a broader sense, and this gets back to Anne's point about that there's some lobbying that is just talking to legislators, there's some lobbying work, there's some policy work that is not about pushing up a specific agenda, it's about gathering people together, it's about educating, educating people, and creating uh, another set of allies. So um, again, this is, I think this is a handout, I won't, I won't cover this stuff, these are some of the things we've, we've accomplished. I will say this, I can't get up here and not tell you what we're trying to push this year or this last year and a half. And please, if you want to help us, we'd love it. Uh, and that is our main, our main objective is to make a mechanism so that of those 4 million people in Georgia who have a record and about 1.2 million, according to a recent study by the University of Georgia, 1.2 million have a felony conviction. And uh, that number in Georgia, there is still not a way for that conviction to come off your record. 38 other states in this, in this country have a way for your record for it not to show up, uh, usually about showing you've been rehabilitated, not in Georgia. And it's a big barrier for housing, it's a big barrier for employment, and we want to change that. And this is, I think I have a slide up here that uh, is, shows you, this is a quick map to show how bad Georgia is, not as bad as Alabama, God bless Alabama. Uh, but at any rate, we need to make Georgia better on this front. We need to make Georgia better because, and by the way, this is kind of math. This is another piece. One thing that works great with legislators down at the state house, we learned, is that is shaming them, not based on what Montana or California or Michigan is doing, shaming them based on what their neighbors are doing. Because they'll say, well, what other, what, what's everybody else in the South doing? Well, what's Alabama, what's Tennessee doing? You know, what's South Carolina doing? This is, this is why we do maps that are focused on the South. And when Georgia looks bad on these maps, it helps us move the needle. So I want it to be better, but it helps. This is one of the mechanisms we use. All right, I'm going to stop there. I've got my, my time. I think I am. Okay. And we'll answer questions later. Thank you. And Marissa will carry us on. So I, um, good afternoon. Yes. So I sent the slides over in one format, and they are in another format. So you just have to bear with us as we adjust to these Beautiful slides and then a, a very nice format. Um, so again, my name is Marissa Dotson. I'm an attorney and I'm the public policy director at the Southern Center for Human Rights. Um, you are just going to be inundated by criminal justice um, law uh, discussion today because the Southern Center for Human Rights is also uh, committed to transforming the criminal justice system uh, in a more uh, broad way. Doug talked about being specific around I'm touching buttons. Um, Doug talked about specifically um, looking at collateral consequences or reentry. Well, the Southern Center for Human Rights is an organization that has been around for over 40 years. We are uh, deeply committed to equality um, under the, in the criminal justice system for people who are uh, marginalized either because of race or because of their economic uh, means. Um, we are, as, we, as you see here, uh, committed to equality, dignity, and justice for people who are involved in the system. This is everything from um, a traffic ticket. Georgia is uh, one of 22 states where every traffic offense is a crime, uh, all the way through the implementation of the death penalty in states like Georgia and Alabama. Um, we have three units. I'm the director of our public policy unit. We also have an impact litigation unit. This is a combination of lawyers and investigators who are committed to the ways in which the criminal justice system impacts people and families. So that is the speeding ticket and private probation companies and the predatory practices of bail, the uh, bail bond industry, thinking about long sentences that people are receiving for, for small amounts of drugs, looking at how people are treated inside jails and prisons and thinking about conditions uh, in a more appropriate way. You may have heard recently about some of our our work around um, Georgia's SMU or the, the place where they keep people with serious mental illness um, and some of the devastating ways that people are being um, caged in our state. 
Um, the, so that's our impact litigation unit. We have our capital uh, litigation unit, and that is a collection of lawyers and investigators who are committed to the implementation of the death penalty and, um, and trying to, uh, you know, our ultimate goal is to abolish it, but at least to uh, address uh, things like racial bias. So you might have heard over the last few years, we have had some cases go to the Supreme Court around uh, the use of um, Racial, the, the effect of racial bias in the jury selection process and how that impacts capital cases primarily in the South. So um, we, we said this earlier, but we aim to end the death penalty, um, end mass incarceration, and uh, address the criminalization of poverty. We seek to protect the right to counsel. Southern Center was um, my, uh, Sarah Tatanchi, who's the executive director of the Southern Center, was Southern Center's public policy director. And under her leadership, um, this was the, the uh, she advocated for the creation of Georgia's Indigent Defense Act. So in 2003, um, she is at, you know, working at the Capitol, stop touching buttons, um, working at the Capitol and trying to advocate for people to have um, zealous and effective representation when they're charged with um, felonies, but all crimes in Georgia. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about racial justice. Um, as you all uh, are keenly aware, um, Georgia, uh, like most uh, states in the country, have um, significant disparities when it comes to how the system impacts people of color. Um, and so what Southern Center is committed to is working to, up, to uproot the structural racism and oppression that the criminal justice system was founded upon. And what's important uh, to remember is, you know, I always talk about People will say, well, the system is failing. You know, the system is broken. You know, neither of those are true. The system is not broken and it's not failing. It is doing exactly what it was intended to do. The outcomes that we are seeing in terms of racial and economic disparities were built into the system. If you haven't already um, had a chance to view documentaries like the 13th on Netflix or read things like Slavery by Another Name or the New Jim Crow, you should because this kind of way in which um, we have used the exception to the 13th Amendment to create and mobilize um, uh, private sector efforts to continue to oppress um, people of color is um, something that we need to address in a more, um, I'm going to say overt, but uh, we need to make more of a conversation about racial justice when we're having some of these conversations. And what Michelle Alexander talks about in her book is that this notion that we'll move away from race, that we can start having a colorblind system, that we can, the, more we, the less we talk about it, the better off we'll be. What we know is that that is not true and that we um, are keenly aware of our, of our effort to try to address uh, racial bias. So in terms of um, that issue as it relates to economic um, race, um, what we find is race and economic, of course, are always inextricably, inextricably, inextricably linked. Excuse me. This is Mr. Adele Edwards. He is an intellectually disabled um, man who is a senior citizen. This is his... This is his home at the time uh, that we found him. He did not have uh, running water. Uh, Mr. Edwards was arrested for burning leaves in his front yard. Um, that is, again, a crime uh, in the state of Georgia. He was uh, given a $500 fine. He was unable to pay his fine, and so um, he was asked to pay $250 in court that day. He did not have it, and so Mr. Edwards was incarcerated um, because he did not have, have funds. Um, what we know about uh, predatory practices for people who um, do not have the funds to manage um, fines and fees and surcharges. So for some of us, you know, going in and paying a speeding ticket or paying a, a failing to maintain lane ticket is really simple. If you don't have money to pay, then your chances of being on, pro on private probation, subject to drug um, testing and additional fines and fees. Um, we've actually had clients who withdrew from opportunities to volunteer places because they knew that they were on criminal probation. They did not feel that they could do things like uh, participate in their Sunday school activities because of kind of the way the system was, was um, holding them under control. So what Southern Center did in terms of uh, representing folks like Mr. Edwards who are finding themselves, and we have, we have so many stories about the ways in which uh, people who don't have means kind of are, uh, um, come against the criminal justice system in this way. Um, we advocated for reforms to the system to deal with predatory practices of private companies. One example of the way that private companies were involved in some of this practice is 
Georgia's law or uh, debtor, many of you may know that debtor's prisons are unconstitutional. You may have heard that before, that we don't have debtor's prisons any longer. However, what private probation companies are doing, what, what they were doing, which is kind of savvy, is if folks didn't have their money to pay their supervision fee or their fine or their, or their surcharge or whatever it, it was, they would say to them, how about you don't come back here until you have my money? So the probationer would hear that as, I shouldn't even go report to my probation officer if I don't have my money. And so the way that private probation companies would do that is when that person didn't show up, it becomes failure to report and not failure to pay, and then that is a way to be incarcerated. They were issuing, issuing arrest warrants without even having a judge have to, um, to review the process. And so that was another way that people were finding themselves incarcerated because they weren't making these fees. So House Bill 310 is a, was a bill um, from several years ago that combated or addressed private probation companies. It caps fees on the, the amount of money that these, that these companies can charge. It establishes some protections in between a re, um, you know, failure to pay or failure to report and incarceration by requiring a judge to have a hearing. Um, and again, this is just a, an example of the way in which our organization is engaged in public policy work to the extent that we know that folks like Mr. Edwards are running into these kinds of issues every day on an individual basis. How can we address the system itself to make sure that these kinds of things don't happen? Um, with our litigation efforts and our public policy efforts, at least two companies in Georgia, private probation companies in Georgia, have gone out of business. So that shows you just kind of how these kind of pressures can work. Absolutely. So that's so, um, I talked about this a little bit. That slide was actually supposed to go in another place. But um, stages of the criminal justice system with the most disparities, I could go through everything from stop through whether or not you get the death penalty or a sentence to death. You should know, for example, that Georgians and uh, uh, African Americans in Georgia are seven times more likely to be arrested, more likely to be so uh, stopped, detained, held pretrial without bail, um, given a sentence of incarceration, um, uh, more likely to be revoked and sent back to jail if they if they are uh, come up against some problem while they're on supervision. So at every stage, again, you're going to find that being a person of color is going to offer uh, is going to um, cause some disparities. And um, our job again is to try to find those places in the system and advocate for reforms that will make a difference there. So when you think about uh, the way in which our criminal justice system is, is being used and you think about one of the drivers for mass incarceration, you think about this war on drugs. And that, that often comes up in terms of how our systems have, this system has been intentional on incarcerating folks for drug and property crimes in an overwhelming way. And what we know in Georgia is that individuals who were sentenced to very long periods of time, 30 years, 60 years, life, LWAP is life without parole, overwhelmingly are people of color. In fact, every person in Georgia who was sentenced to at, le to at least 30 years for drugs is a person of color. So again, it's not, and, and you all may know already that when you think about use and all the studies around um, use and sell, that African Americans are equally or less likely to use drugs and equally or less likely to sell drugs. So this again is not about a, a conduct that we find so abhorrent that it needs to be incarcerated. We are being intentional in the way that this policy is being implemented to do this for folks of color. So this is our client, uh, Mr. Wilmot, Wilmart Martin. Mr. Martin was sentenced to um, life without parole in 1991 for having 3.4 grams of cocaine. The reason why the nickel is on the, the slide is because that is actually more in weight than what Mr. Martin had at, when he received this, um, this LWAP sentence. He spent um, nearly over 25 years incarcerated for this crime. He was the only person from his county that had an LWAP sentence. He was given more time than folks sentenced to murder, to rape, to robbery, to armed robbery, to aggravated child molestation. This, the penalty is you know, the most extreme, but for the death penalty. So the way in which Georgia's law was working in terms of getting folks like Mr. Martin incarcerated for these long periods of time was through what we call our 
uh, two strikes or three strikes law. It's also called recidivist sentencing. This is a way to punish people for getting in trouble again. So the more times you're convicted of a felony, the, 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 uh, that is when you think about imposing mandatory minimum sentences and no judicial discretion once the recidivist statute has been implemented if this is your second serious violent felony or your third felony or your fourth felony, the, the idea that you will run into our Georgia's kind of harsh sentencing law is, is um, relatively high. So what we were able to do, uh, what Southern Center was able to do for folks like Mr. Martin is through our litigation uh, units. So there's a partnership between our capital and, li and impact litigation units to go and identify folks like Mr. Martin who are serving long periods of time in prison for drug offenses and, and work with the prosecutor and the judge in those communities to get those folks released. We've been uh, successful in getting more than 22 people released from prison in the last three or four years just in our individual advocacy. And we were um, responsible for the change in Georgia's law related to the use of the recidivist statute when it comes to eligibility for parole for people who are sentenced to this time. So there now is a mechanism statutorily that allows parole eligibility for individuals when they've been sentenced to this kind of time. So again, that just shows how we use our representation and litigation arm as well as our public policy advocacy to try to transform systems. I know I talk fast. Hi, everybody. Okay. Um, so I talked to you a little bit earlier. This is just a recent example of how of some press that we got um, about a, one of our, our clients, Mr. Johnny Gates. Mr. Gates was sentenced to death uh, more than 40 years ago by an all-white jury in Columbus. Uh, I mentioned to you earlier we won at a Supreme Court case a few years ago uh, on this issue of racial bias in the jury selection process. This is another example of, of looking at a case to determine how the uh, defendant's race impacted their death sentence or their trial. Um, this is, I know that it's probably hard to see, but these are the prosecutor's notes. And what we know, so uh, this is the prosecutor's notes about potential jurors. What the prosecutor had done here is label people of color or black people with an N next to their name. They also referred to African Americans as hostile, lazy. Um, they, there was a, um, a guy who owned a construction company who employed lots of African American people. And there's a note that says, we really need this guy because he's used to working with these people. And he, he'll, he should be good when it comes to understanding how these people work. So this, this reference or um, uh, use of their strikes and their notes that show that they were intentional about trying to strike people of color from their jury is important when you think about the way that um, what I just mentioned to you about disparity, that if you have an all-white jury and it's an African-American defendant, the likelihood of, of being sentenced, being found guilty, and to be sentenced to death is much higher. It also, excluding folks from juries who are actually your peer, right? So this conversation about going and having a jury of your peers, well, how is it a jury of your peers if none of them look like you or come from your, from your community? Uh, you know, your, your true community. And so some of our work around Mr. Gates' case in terms of advocating for relief in his case, but also in thinking about how we might be able to address racial bias in jury selection generally. What kinds of reforms might we be able to do that would allow or prevent something like this from happening again? So this slide was just my attempt to just demonstrate um, how reform has worked in Georgia since 2012. Uh, I actually started, as Doug mentioned, in 2008 at Georgia Justice Project, working on their public policy efforts around grand and criminal records. Prior to what we have in Governor Deal, the conversations about criminal justice reform just were not happening in this state. We weren't thinking about meaningful, positive, responsible ways to do criminal justice reform. Both organizations like Southern Center, who have been down at the Capitol for a long time, were really just trying to stop bad bills from passing. It was more about, to Anne's point earlier, just trying to do what we could to protect the communities that we served and not really advocating for much more because the likelihood of getting much more was so unlikely. Um, and so having said that, under Governor Deal, who was intentional about criminal justice reform, he came in and made criminal justice his primary issue. We have seen the kind of transformation in Georgia, the beginning of transformation in Georgia, that can turn us around if we continue on this right path. Uh, and so, you know, this, this summary here is what we have done uh, proactively in, since 2012 to try to address our system. So in 2012, 
We look at sentencing reform. How, how many people are we sending to prison? We, at that time, I'm done. Oh, three minutes. Oh, I'm, I'm working it out here. Good. Um, so uh, in 2012, the focus was on the state was spending over a billion dollars on corrections. Our recidivism rate was almost 35%. And Governor Deal, right, this is the height of our recession. Our, we are looking for dollars wherever we can. It was a very fiscally responsible position to take to say, is there a better way that we could be spending our money? We also knew at that time that the majority of people that were in our prisons were not there for the kinds of things we wanted them to be there for, right? We think about, there was this, this, uh, this phrase that Governor Dill became um, famous for, which is that we wanna use our prison beds for folks that we are scared of and not mad at. So maybe our prison beds are not appropriate for someone who's just struggling with addiction or someone who has mental health issues. So we have the, um, a conversation about uh, exploring opportunities in the community to get folks treated for the things that are causing them to be in the system in the first place, saving again our pulling people and putting them in cages for people who we are afraid will pose some kind of public safety risk in a, in a significant way. Um, we also had, did things like change our threshold. So Georgia hadn't looked at the threshold that, caught, that um, uh, um, was theft by taking in 25 years. So it was still a felony to, um, to steal something that was over $500. Every, most states, including those in the South, to Doug's point, have moved that up to make it more reflective of the time that we live in. So we did that in 2012, too, making it so that less people were even being convicted for felonies because they weren't really committing the kind of conduct that would have been that egregious 25 years or so ago. In 2013, and the same thing was true, we took a look at our juvenile justice system. It was a time to think about how we were spending our dollars sending kids to out-of-state facilities away from their parents and their community. It actually cost over $100,000 a year to send a kid to an out-of-home facility. So again, it was not a good use of fiscal dollars and taxpayer dollars. So there was a conversation about how we could keep kids in their community and what we could do across the state to ensure that families had what they needed to, to keep kids from going into uh, juvenile facilities. Year three is when they finally took notice of our reentry, um, you know, this, this issue about what was happening when people are coming out of prison um, and what happens when you have a record. So Georgia became the first state in the deep south to pass or to have ban the box um, to remove the application on or the question on the state's application about the use of uh, um, uh, one's criminal history. 2015, I told you about misdemeanor probation reform. That's that look at those private probation companies and how they are uh, preying on people convicted of misdemeanor offenses. Uh, par uh, parole and reentry up, comes up again in 16. This is the creation of a few agencies in Georgia that were specifically designed to work on um, reentry and community supervision and think about what was happening in communities in a more intentional way. Um, we think about the parole eligibility for drug resentencing. All of those kinds of conversa conversations are happening at that point. 17 is about felony probation reform. So that is different than our private industry. This is really folks who are, um, and, and Georgia has some of the highest rates of probation in the country. We have folks on felony probation for 20 years, 30 years. I've actually seen folks that are on probation for life. This has devastating impacts on their civic engagement and their ability to move on in their lives. So there was some efforts in 2017 to get folks off of felony probation earlier or to find, try to find some ways to use our supervision resources on folks that really should be supervised instead of having folks just, you know, having these very long probation sentences that we know weren't actually affected. Um, this year in, in 18, uh, not only do we have bail reform at the city of Atlanta level, and I'd be happy to kind of talk to you about local engagement, which is something that Southern Center is being uh, is focusing on at this point, considering the state dynamics and the fact that we've had several years of kind of big state reforms. How can we kind of work in local communities to build some where there is political will and interest to kind of think about what cities like Atlanta and Fulton County might do? Um, this year we had uh, a, a specific focus on bail. Um, and that is, again, that you know, the purpose of bail is to ensure someone will come back to court and that they won't pose any safety risk to the community. In Georgia, every person um, arrested of a misdemeanor has a right to bail. But what we know uh, through some of our litigation and some of our advocacy practices is that folks are being incarcerated in jails in Georgia for no reason other than they don't have money. Um, somebody in Atlanta, we represented an individual, his name was Sean Ramsey. He was charged with holding a sign that said, homeless, please help, 
Mr. Ramsey was not able to pay his bail amount. I can't remember if it's 200 or five. It might have been $200. $200 bail amount um, in the city of Atlanta, and he was held in custody for more than 70 days. So again, this was not about him posing a risk and at the cost, at the expense to taxpayers of upwards of $60 a day. So we as taxpayers spent $60 a day for more than 70 days for an individual charged with holding a sign that said he was homeless because he couldn't afford $200 to get out. So we've done some things with misdemeanor bail. There's a lot more that we need to do um, at the state and local level, but we are encouraged by where we are and that we may be able to um, get our next governor, whoever he or she is, to be equally committed in, in reforms in this way, not only because of the compassion and humanitarian interest that those of us in this room have, but because we know that when we do this, it works. Georgia's sending less folks to prison. We're saving taxpayer dollars. We're seeing declines in our recidivism rate. So this notion that you can uh, re reform your system to send less folks to prison is unsafe. You know, we might have heard that Jeff Sessions came a few weeks ago and made that claim. Absolutely false. I really hope that the op-ed we worked on is placed in the AJC today. Check out the AJC because I heard that it would be. Um, but we have a response to that notion that what, we've, what we're doing here isn't working because it is. Here's the road ahead for us, kind of broad bucket. Um, decriminalization of, tra of minor offenses like traffic and marijuana, equity and fines and fees and surcharges, looking at improving access to substance abuse and mental health treatment, ending harsh mandatory sentences and addressing racial bias from start to finish in the system. Um, I think that's, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm out. There's my contact information. My question specifically was for Doug. I know you said that your board kind of let you get up and, and say that we're gonna start this policy thing. But what if your board isn't so inclined to start um, policy. That's, Do you have a, a best practice to kind of get them engaged? Let, let me, uh, that's a, I didn't even talk about that. It's a great point. Um, my board was nervous when we uh, decided to do this, and they were very worried about how far we would go. Uh, policy work is a whole other beast, and they kept thinking we could all of a sudden be advocating, I don't know, against giraffes in the zoo. I mean, you know, you, you, they were just worried. I mean, how far, how outside of their box would we get? And uh, in the first few years, we had to get our policy agenda approved by the board. Uh, and so there was a lot of concern about that, mainly from how the organization would show up externally. Let me say, when you, policy work is an external thing. So you're showing up in the community in a way, if, like for us, we've done direct service for you know, 25 years, and we start showing up in a policy arena, it's a whole different way of showing up in the community. And they were worried about what we were messaging and how far we were willing to go, and could they control that? Um, or just have a say-so in that. Um, there also was concern from the board about would we lose funders? And our organization is about 40% individual funding, 40% foundations, 20% sort of events and uh, institutions. So it's a, it's a good mix, but they were worried about individuals, which is a good part of our funding, saying, wait a second, we want you, we're, you know, we'll write a check to you to help somebody, but we will not write a check to change the law. So there were some of those concerns they had that they wanted to, to monitor and check for a while. But really, I think after a couple of years, I mean, um, one, I, don't, I think we gained more funders than we lost, uh, certainly, but more importantly, the board, I think, got more comfortable in seeing that we were staying in, inside, inside a, a line. I mean, and it's easy to get off track. I, I will say, I've seen nonprofits all of a sudden start, you know, we, Marissa and I used to have this conversation, uh, people were asking us to go advocate for stuff that we didn't feel, I mean, you start getting pulled in lots of ways, and, and they, were, they knew that, and they, were, they gave us some good advice about how not to do that. But once we sort of, I think, got those, those guardrails up, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's been a smooth sailing. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, that's a good question. Let me add, oftentimes boards, just like everybody else, don't under, understand what the difference is between politics and issues. And if you can have someone that can kind of show them, here's the electioneering end of the spectrum and we can't go there, we can't get involved in politics, here's the space that we can be in, issue-oriented advocacy and lobbying, then people are much more comfortable. But what I've noticed in my work is that a lot of nonprofits either don't want to do anything at all, or if they go ahead and do it, they do it all wrong because they don't understand where the guardrails are. And you can see that, the, that what's at stake is really as serious as a heart attack as far as issues are concerned. And before we go on, I want to ask the two of you, because you gave such powerful presentations, how can people here sign up to get email alerts 
from you? How can they get involved in the next Justice Day? Oh, so um, you can go to our website, www.schr.org, and sign up for our newsletter. Um, if you are an organization that's interested in criminal justice reform you, or, or know someone who's working on some of these issues, we have a statewide coalition. It's called the Georgia Justice Reform Partnership. And it is committed to mobilizing community, you know, individuals and organizations. We have 85 members, 50 organizations kind of meet regularly. We sponsor, co-sponsor this Justice Day. So that is a way to get involved. If you're interested, please send me an email. Um, my, yep, my email address is right there, M. Dodson. I'm in the way. M. Dodson at schr.org. Similarly, I should look at my, we have a, on our website at gjp.org, there's a way of signing up to get our policy information. And so, the, yeah, gjp.org, very similar. We're, we're involved in this. Episode. And um, Justice Day is uh, February 26th. I should know. Is that right? No, that's right. February 26th. Yeah, Monday, the February 26th. So look out for information on, you know, how we bring hundreds of folks to the Capitol. You have on your tables uh, the last public policy agenda that our United Way board approved. We'll be having another one beginning in, for the 2019 cycle of the General Assembly, but you can also get legislative updates from us. It's on the slide handout that you have. Just uh, go onto our, our home page and follow the links to public policy. Hi. My question is for the whole panel, um, and, and I think you started answering it. What are maybe the top two biggest mistakes organizations make when they are either starting a public policy uh, um, a program or they're engaging in it? I'll just say because I know we, we had this conversation a lot. I, I think the, deciding exactly what you're going to do, I mean deciding the guardrails, like we are going to do X, Y, or Z, this is our limit. I mean, putting limits on what your the issues and even what you're going to get. Because I mean, I'll be honest, when we start, I know you remember some of these stories, but when we started showing up the Capitol, maybe because, mainly because of the governor, I had people, organizations that had a lot longer ramp of doing policy coming to us, asking us to help them. And I'm thinking, you've been at this 10 years longer than us. Why are you asking us? And I think for them, it was because they saw us having some momentum and juice, mainly because of the governor or whatever. But I mean, it was, those guardrails were very helpful to say, no, we are focused on these issues and or, or these outcomes for this year. These are the three things we're going to work on. Yeah. And, and I think that, that that was very helpful for us, I think. You can get way sidetracked. Yeah, it's easy to get sidetracked. Yeah, and I guess to that point, I would say, you know, um, I think that part of what has been successful in the years I've been at the Capitol is that um, you research, you know, you read, you have, you've looked at the law that you want to change and know exactly what it is you want to change and how that will impact the population that you're working with. You are connected with impacted folks. So one of the sweet spots of Southern Center and Georgia Justice Project is we have lawyers who represent folks. So then we are working with the laws, not only because we're representing folks, so it's easier for us to say, you know what, it would be a lot easier, it would be a lot more fair and just if the law, instead of you know, letting folks wait two years to have a record expunged if it were this kind of way. And we were able to articulate a clear process for what the law should be. What I think is that a lot, a lot of times nonprofits have, uh, or and I shouldn't, yeah, I guess nonprofits, have this idea for like, I want to transform child support, you know, or, you know, it's really bad in terms of like how foster kids are treated. Well, that's not really enough. And you can get folks down to the Capitol with their signs, I love kids, I love, you know, I, but if you're not intentional about this is the specific way in which the law could change for us and m mobilizing people to be in support of that, I think that it's, it's probably not going to be a legislative effort that will get done. The other mistake that people make or organizations can make is what's your timeline? What kind of commitment are you willing to put forward into this? Both Doug and Marissa can tell you that most significant changes are years-long propositions. That's a very different um, pr proposition than something that I can go to the Capitol this year and get that fixed, and I don't really care who I piss off because I just want to get that thing fixed. If you're in it for that's right. That's right. years, because that's how long it's going to take, then you need to be playing with other people in your same sandbox. You need to have those relationships with people that share your goals, have the relationships with the legislative committees that these things are going to go to, because if you're in it for the long haul, that's the difference. And have you, have you all ever heard all politics is local? 
So I, I actually am encouraging folks to get connected with their local governments and, lo and groups who are working in community at the local level because that is a good segue. Go sit at your city council meeting, listen to, how, you know, get some, some information right there where you live um, that could be helpful to you as you kind of build toward, towards a more statewide effort. I thank, thank all of you for all the hard work you do and it's a lot of good information, I appreciate it all the hard work you are doing and the working in the sandbox and the years long approaches, to what degree do you see those efforts thwarted by things like private prison systems and economic factors that really don't have a lot to do with the legal system? Mm -hmm. And that may not be a fair question to ask you right now. No, it's a very fair question. It comes up a lot. Um, I, it, it, uh, it came up for us with our bail reform work because the bail industry sees the elimination of cash bail as a fundamental attack on their ability to take care of themselves. And um, businesses uh, you know, who are concerned about things like shoplifting and theft were come out in terms of what we might be doing to impact their ability to you know, have... Um, no solic nobody soliciting in front of their business or whatever it is. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we, um, what we try to do is make the case to the government, the policymakers at the government level, in terms of how much money they are spending, how much taxpayer dollars are being spent to perpetuate that or to fund this industry. And in terms of like our bail work, like I mentioned to you, Sean Ramsey, we're talking this, the taxpayers paying $60 a day for this, it, it, they were, so we're able to make, I think, dollars and cents to some of this criminal records. You're thinking about, you know, if you're not hiring with someone with a criminal record, if a third of Georgians have a criminal record, what are we doing to um, taxable, you know, money we could be collecting in taxes? And what are we doing for applicant pools in terms of how employers are finding, you know, the most qualified candidates? So we always have to have some argument as to what we are doing and how what we're doing is actually going to be better for Georgia's economy than worse or the, you know, local economy. I think money is always a factor. You know, one of the things, I, when I first, we started showing up at the Capitol and hearing one of Ann's, a couple of Ann's slides referenced this, you know, uh, a lot of your organizations are probably are funded by the government. Uh, that's one issue you run into immediately. I mean, we are not. I mean, both of our organizations are totally privately funded, and therefore, we're not going to the Capitol to ask for money. So one of the first questions anybody doing policy work is saying, is it going to cost money? Are we asking money for us? Or is it going to cost money to do X, Y, or Z? Money's always a moving part of this. And this is right, one of the things we, fortunately in the last you know, 10 years, criminal justice reform has really realized that uh, in this state and many others, that uh, if you can make the economic argument that you're gonna save money for the state. In other words, we weren't going down there saying we want more money to do for probation or whatever. We're going down there, we wanna save money for the state too. So we were always, I mean, these positions we've been in lately have not been asking for money. I mean, for us, because we don't take it. We haven't been asking for money to fund more things for the state. We've been saying we think we can make an economic argument that will save the state money. And, and for us, and even more, uh, is that the private sector wants these things because it will help them meet their bottom line. And so I think money is one of the things you've got to be conscious of, and it's always a moving target in any, in any enterprise, I think, uh, in terms of policy. Because it, it adds a different dynamic to your organization as it does for United Way because we do have grants and contracts from the state that support parts of our work. So <laughs> unlike Doug and Marissa's organization, we do rely on those kinds of relationships that are positive to be able to support those that that, that those funding sources. So it, like it, a lot of it's like a rubric's cube putting together like what what will be your sweet spot, but you can do it. Mm -hmm. Um, can I say something real quick? I just had a, a thought. So uh, unlikely allies. So one of the one of the kind of successes for our work is to find a partner that people would not normally think that you would be partnered with mm -hmm. to make this change. So Georgia Public Policy Foundation is a conservative think tank. They deal with ed political education for folks, cons you know, conservative leaning um, candidates. And so we have find, found ways to partner with them on advocating for responsible criminal justice 
reform. So when you say to a legislator who may not otherwise have been willing to listen that you're working with Georgia Public Policy Foundation or Georgia if you're Center for Opportunity. Georgia, that's yeah. right. Or thinking yeah. about employers, you know, like when you're able to say, you know, Home Depot, for example, has done ban the box and we are working closely with some of, some of these employers and these employers are asking for criminal records to be treated differently. It's it is a partnership that they don't necessarily expect and it bodes well in certain settings in the capital. Yes, absolutely. One more question. Last question, folks. Um, thanks again for your presentation. Um, I, this is for anyone that can answer this question. In working with clients that do have criminal records, what would you suggest is the best way to advocate for them to overcome those barriers of housing and employment? Because we see a lot of our clients you know, going through this on a daily basis. And, and is there a process for them to get records expunged for certain offenses? So <laughs> that's my question. This, this is, we're the, uh, yeah. What, what's your name? What, what, what organization else are you with? What's your um, uh, Fayette County Council on Domestic Violence. And okay. Well, we, we don't go looking for clients, uh, but, we, but we're the only group in the state that offers criminal records help. I mean, um, because of the policy work, the other thing we didn't talk about, too, is we didn't mean to become the experts in criminal records in the state, but we have been. I should have brought a couple of the books that we've written or produced regularly on records. If you go to our website, there's a ton of information. We, um, so the answer would be come to us. <laughs> Unfortunately, don't tell, my, don't tell Brenda and Catherine in the office because we get overwhelmed with cases. Um, but so this is a big... So I would try to give you some bite-sized piece here. One of the cool things happening around the state recently, and only in the last year and a half, and a lot because of John Eaves, who was the head of the Fulton County Gov chair of Fulton County Commission in the government, uh, are these things called expungement summits or expungement, you know, restriction summits. And we have, our organization has worked with all of them. In fact, uh, I've been, a, they're often on a Saturday. There was a recent one in Rockdale, uh, uh, DeKalb, Clayton's pulling one off, Coweta. Fulton's going to do two before, we're involved in one in two weeks. Next, next week, Fulton's doing one. So one of the things your community could do is, and I know that not one has happened in Fayette yet, so Fayette could have an expungement summit. And the, for instance, and these are powerful ways of doing lots of things, not just helping a lot of people, but we found them a great way, again, this interplay between direct service and policy, which is a powerful interplay. So what your community could do is you could go back to your community and say, we should have one of these things. There have been about 10 or so in the, in the state so far, and they are rolling kind of like crazy in a good way. But what it does in one day, what, if you set it up, and you have to have government players to pull this off, usually the court and the prosecutor and the clerk and the, and the sheriff and the police, because that's how expungement sort of works or record restriction works in the state. But if you, did, if you pulled one of these together, Somebody can walk in or get, sign up and get their record restricted in one day at no cost. This is the way most counties do them. Uh, that will normally take under the laws that exist about you know, two to three, four, five months at a cost. So one of the things you can do is, is get that moving in your county. But even more importantly, what that will do is it'll educate the county about these issues. And so then the county can help you know, re remove some barriers and also help come along with us and others to help remove barriers to the state house as well. That's not a, the best answer. I mean, I, it, okay, right, sure. One quick point about expungement is you current under current Georgia law, you cannot get convictions off unless it start, like very limited, very limited. Uh, right. convictions, misdemeanor convictions. So generally speaking, folks that have been convicted of a crime in Georgia are not going to benefit from uh, expungement clinics. Unless you come and help us move the law this year, then we'll, then because as soon as the law changes, hey. God willing, seriously, as soon as the law changes, and we this is what we're pushing for. As soon as Georgia catches up with the 30 other, 38 other states and you can get convictions off your record by essentially showing you've been rehabilitated, which is, you know, we're in the Bible Belt, God bless us, we should all be sort of adhering to those kinds of principles, <laughs> that if, you can, if we get to that place, then you start having these expungement summits, they are going to go ballistic. Who benefits right now? Who, what do you mean? I'm People sorry. charged but not convicted. Right. So if you were acquitted, if it was dismissed, those kinds of things. Or, yeah, yeah and it's a couple smaller exceptions. Nobody wants to leave. They're so captivating. <laughs> let's think, let's think, I know. Come up and ask your My very first inter interaction with United Way as a community volunteer involved you, and you don't know it. <laughs> I, in the Opportunity Zone in College Park, there was a woman who would 
fighting the fact that she was a fugitive. They were, re they, she, re she was referred to your organization. Y'all were helpful in giving her explanation. You said, I can't take on your case. We can't, help. but this, because it was in Virginia. This is what we need, you need to do. When I finally, as a volunteer, was able to sit with her and go, what is it that's holding you back? And she finally told me I'm a fugitive. As a volunteer, I was able to advocate for her in, in Virginia. And actually, we took her back to Virginia and got her record corrected. And everything was wiped away. We paid the last thing. And she got to stand there and watch the lady push the button that took away where it said fugitive. And she's been employed ever since. So I just want to let you know that. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.